turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Uh, We're going to be looking at the whole chapter today, but I'm only going to read the first 14 verses. Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 to 14, page 879. As Jesus left and was going out of the temple complex, his disciples came and called his attention to the temple buildings. Then he replied to them, Don't you see all these things? I assure you, not one stone will be left here on another that will not be thrown down. While he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately and said, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Then Jesus replied to them, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah, and they'll deceive many. You're going to hear wars and rumours of wars. See that you're not alarmed, because these things must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these events are the beginning of birth pains. Then they'll hand you over for persecution and they'll kill you. You'll be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will take offence, betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Because lawlessness will multiply, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be delivered. This good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Since 1978, Afghanistan has been racked by some form of war or another. Uh, Since 1948, Burma has had various ethnic uprisings, dictatorships and civil violence. Since 1991, Somalia has been ripped apart by clan violence Since 1964, Colombia has endured civil war. Since 2014, the Ukraine has been threatened by Russia and is now invaded. Wars and rumours of wars. Nations against nations. Uh, On the two days of April 6 and 7 this week, there were 23 earthquakes around the globe. Since January this year, Four significant areas have been declared as under famine conditions, Ethiopia, Nigeria, South Sudan and Yemen. Famines and earthquakes in various places. Uh, With the combined effects of COVID, rising oil prices, which we're all feeling, and overt violence in the Ukraine, the website Rapture Ready has used the Rapture Index to measure the likelihood of the end of the world based on current world events matched with the Bible. It's now at 187 out of 200, the highest it's ever been since September 11, when it hit 182. Is it the end of the world? Should we understand that God's Easter plans this year are that the world will cease today? Well, funnily enough, Jesus was asked a similar question, wasn't he, just a couple of years ago? And he gave us a very helpful answer. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, We sit in great comfort. It is really hard to think about the end of the world on such a glorious day. Uh, The grass is green. You can almost hear it growing. Uh, We're in comfort. We have Bibles open. Uh, We're singing. Uh, We've got many generations together in this building, Father, It's very hard to think about the end of the world. Father, thank you for Jesus' words in the middle of this last sermon he preached. Please apply them to us and encourage us. Amen. At point two on the outline, Jesus has entered Jerusalem. He came riding on a donkey. Uh, Very clearly he was making people aware that he's God's promised king. He's the humble king come to bring the outsider in by dealing with sin. He's cleared his house, he's sat in the temple, he's exercised his authority, he's been under consistent attack. Can you imagine attacking a king in his own throne room? That's really what's been happening, isn't it? We we looked at that last week. 
Different coalitions of the willing have sallied forth from the religious leaders and posed malicious questions. He's answered all of them and now he's silenced them. Now Jesus goes on the offensive. Uh, In chapters 23 to 25, last great sermon. Uh, He preaches five sermons in Matthew. This is the last. Read Matthew 23. It's a corker. Uh, It's got one key word, woe, and not in a good way. Woe, woe, woe. To the religious leaders, it is brutal. He finishes by saying, your house will be desolate. And at the start of 24, he leaves as Jesus left and was going out of the temple complex. His disciples came and called his attention to the temple buildings. And then he replied to them, don't you see all these things? I assure you, not one of these stones will be left here on another that will not be thrown down. Significant when a king leaves his own house, isn't it? Have you thought about that as Jesus is leaving? He's gone, I'm leaving my palace. I'm leaving my capital. And as they leave, the disciples go, hey, hey, Jesus, how flash are these buildings? How impressive is the stonework? Look at how shiny the edifice is. And Jesus bursts their bubble, doesn't he? It's going to be demolished, wiped out. No stone left on another. And and let me tell you, they're big stones, 40 foot in length, some of them. Ginormous, torn down. He's sitting on the Mount of Olives and his disciples come to him privately and say, we've got two questions. Uh, They're there in verse 3. When will the temple be destroyed? And what's the sign of the end of the world when you come back? The location is important. It's opposite Jerusalem. And so they're looking at Jerusalem. In fact, we're told in the book of Ezekiel, when Ezekiel in chapter 11 has a vision of God leaving the temple, where does God go? He stands on the Mount of Olives and pronounces judgment over the world. That's what Jesus is doing. I've left my house. Now, the questions are important. I don't think these men have grasped what's going on. They're still looking for a road map that ties to a patch of dirt, an impressive building, and a specific ethnic group. They've been deceived, deceived by how flash those stones are, how beautiful that edifice is. They've been deceived about their dreams of what the Messiah should do. See, that building's going to last forever. And that Messiah, he's going to wallop those Romans. And Jesus answers them. It's a long answer, but it's a corker. And as he talks to them, he gently rebukes them and encourages them. He says, don't be impressed by the picture in front of you. Let me paint a picture of what you need to be. Don't be impressed by the picture in front of you. Let me paint a picture of what you need to be. And we've got to keep three keys in mind. I'm at point three on the outline. Uh, The first key is this. Jesus uses language. It's not language you use at Woolies, really, is it? This kind of language. As you describe, oh, where are the frozen peas? Okay, You don't use colourful language. Jesus is using really colourful language, isn't he? Jesus is using lots of images. Uh, It's a type of literature in the Bible called apocalyptic. Uh, The Greek word means making things clear. Kind of strange, isn't it? Uh, Daniel and Revelation are the two typical books like this. And Jesus quotes Daniel a number of times. That's the first key, his language. Uh, The second key is the way Jesus deals with his questions. Uh, this commentary, if you're looking for a thin book to put on your bookshelf to make you look intelligent, uh, that's what I do, that's why I buy thick books. Uh, This commentary makes clear what Jesus is doing, and I couldn't put it better than this. Let me read to you from this. Jesus' sermon is about current events, especially the destruction of Jerusalem, becoming a window through which to see the end events especially the coming of the Son of Man. The two events are not unrelated. The destruction of Jerusalem was the prototype for the end of the world. The the destruction of Jerusalem is the lens to look through 
to understand the end of the world. So Jesus is talking about what's going to happen now and he's saying that's going to give you a foretaste of what's going to happen then. What's going to happen now is going to be a foretaste about what happens then and the now is going to be very soon. In AD 70, the Romans march in and destroy the temple and it's horrific. But that becomes a picture of what's going to happen when Jesus returns as the king of all the world. And so as we're working our way through this, you've got to think now, then, now, then. And the final key is the audience. Do you notice who he's talking to here in verse 3? Who's he talking to? It's in private to the 12th. That's it. You know, for the rest of the gospel, Jesus doesn't do any public teaching. It's all for the insider. It's all for the followers. Uh, And what follows is an amazing sermon. Uh, Chapter 24 is just wonderful on so many levels. I want to be very clear, it's bamboozled me all week. Uh, That's why blokes like this are so helpful because I've basically just stolen his structure. No need to reinvent the wheel. But you'll see the structure there on your outline and Jesus begins at point four with the big picture and overview, verses 4 to 14. He wants to take you up high and go, let me just show you the things from end to end. And you'll notice that in verse 3, the disciples are asking about the end of the age, and in verse 14, Jesus says, that's when the end will come. Two bookends, the end. Uh, And in that big picture, Jesus says, there's going to be a great deception. Look there in verse 5. For many will come in my name saying, I'm the Messiah, and they'll deceive many. There's going to be a lot of pretenders. They're going to say, I I claim to speak for Jesus. God has revealed his mind to me. In fact, I've received something new that builds on Jesus and what he was all about. And they're going to lead you away from Jesus. Uh, There's going to be great suffering. Generally in the world, and for God's people in particular, There's going to be wars and rumours of wars, natural disasters and violence, and God's people, as you look there, will be attacked. You'll be persecuted. You'll be killed. You'll be hated by all the nations. People will take offence. Great deception, great suffering, great falling away. Look there in verse 9. Then they'll hand you over for persecution. They'll kill you. You'll be hated by all nations because of my name. Many will take offence, betray one another, hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many because lawlessness will multiply, the love of many will grow cold. God's people are going to be decimated. That's cheerful, isn't it? Many will be deceived. The love of many will grow cold like the religious leaders. Remember them? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And their hearts were hard, and people will turn their backs on Jesus and his mob, even from within the mob, because it will all be just too hard. But there is good news, and that's going to go out to the whole world. Did you see that in verse 14? This good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations. God's people will be decimated, but that won't stop the news about Jesus going out. Have you met the king on a donkey? Have you met the one who died for your sins? He's for everyone, every person. That's the big picture, the big picture that answers the disciples' questions. And let me tell you, it happened in their lifetime. There were false teachers and false proclaimers of God's word. Just read the book of Acts. Read the historian Josephus. They were everywhere. And there were wars right across the Roman Empire in this time. Every year had a new war, culminating in AD 66 when the Jews rose up and in AD 70 were absolutely smashed. There were earthquakes and famines across the whole Roman Empire. There's persecution, if you read the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 7 and 8, that begins in Jerusalem and spreads out and God's people are smashed and people fall away. They turn away from Jesus. And do you know what happens? By the end of the book of Acts, the gospel's gone to the whole known world. Paul's in Rome. 
And even in jail, he's making missionary plans to go to Spain. Everything Jesus said happened now and the temple was destroyed in AD 70 and everything had taken place. But on greater reflection, it's kind of still going on, isn't it? (laughs) Do you notice that? Ever since Jesus ascended into heaven, there's been great deception. Just type into the internet, I speak for Jesus, and look at all the websites. Just look at all the predictions about when Jesus is going to come home and the fact that we've received a new revelation that builds on Jesus, that supersedes Jesus, that actually speaks better for God. People stop watching the news because they're sick of rumours of war, aren't they? And we're tired of the images that seep out. There's natural disasters and that's only four hours away. And they happen throughout the world. There's been a great falling away. Church numbers have declined under COVID. God's people have been attacked, slaughtered. The numbers in Syria in the civil war have dropped to less than 5% of the population from when it was the majority. And what is still happening around the globe? The Bible is being translated. J and S are going to another part of the world. And in the middle of Ramadan, the good news of Jesus is going out. The end will come. The end will come. We're in the end. And it is coming. So so what does Jesus tell you to do? Does he say, go and get a calendar because I'll give you a program? He doesn't say anything of the sort, does he? He gives two very clear commands. Look in verse 4. Watch out that no one deceives you. Uh, Look at verse 6. See that you are not alarmed. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Be discerning. Don't be scared. There's one very clear certainty. It's there in verse 6. These things must take place. The end is not yet. God's in charge. God knows what's going on. God's actually in charge of what's going on. And there's one very clear attitude down there in verse 13. The one who endures to the end will be delivered. That's pretty clear, isn't it? I love the Olympics. I love the Olympics. It's terrific. But listen, let me tell you, don't don't waste your time on the 100-metre sprint. What's the greatest event in the Olympics? It's the event that finishes the Olympics. What's that? It's the marathon. The one who endures. The one who perseveres. And let me tell you, there's one very clear job. Isn't there in verse 14? This good news of the kingdom will be. It's not might be, it's not could be, it will be, it must be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to the nations. Two clear commands, one certainty, one attitude, one job. It was the case until the temple was destroyed in AD 70, it's still the case, isn't it? So that's the big picture uh, with the big picture, Jesus then, you'll see in point five, narrows in. And I want, I really want, I just want to touch on this for a little bit. Verses 15 to 28 has a really distinct Jerusalem flavor. Uh, you'll notice a change in the language because Jesus now focuses in on what his mob gathered around him on the Mount of Olives are going to experience very soon. And he gives a close up of the events leading to AD 70 when the Romans walk in and smash Jerusalem. But he uses the same categories. There's going to be great suffering and great deception. The great suffering happens when something absolutely horrific takes place. Look at verse 15. So when you see the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Jesus quotes Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. And he says there's going to be an unmissable moment And that moment is going to be so horrifically offensive to you. Shane of the Twelve, it's actually going to happen in the middle of my house. It did happen in fulfilment of what Daniel said in 168 BC 
when a local political ruler decided that it would be a great thing to sacrifice a pig in the Holy of Holies. Can you imagine how offensive that is to a Jew? When the local leader says, let's kill a pig in the middle of the temple. And Jesus takes that and says, something just as horrific is going to happen in your lifetime, gentlemen. And it does in AD 70. When the Romans walk in, and they destroy that temple. No stone is left on another. And the boots of a pagan invading army trample the Holy of Holies. And their flag is planted in the middle of God's house. Look what we've done to you. And the great suffering has taken place. Josephus writes that 1.1 million Jews were killed. In the siege of the city, they were reduced to forced cannibalism of each other. And afterwards, many were carried off into exile and Jewish religious life in Jerusalem ceased. They renamed the country and called it Palestine. Could there be anything worse? It was a day to flee. Many of the Christians who listened to Jesus did, and they survived. Those who didn't ate each other. And it was a foretaste of the future. We're moving towards a day that will be like that day. And the great deception continues, doesn't it? And Christians are slaughtered around the world. And people believe the deception and turn away from Jesus And people are slaughtered when they stand connected to Jesus. And it happens today as we meet in a building like this. False preachers, false teachers, false prophets, leading God's people astray and others to slaughter. And again, Jesus is reminding his mob. Just look there in verses 21 and 22, that God is in control. The days are limited. God knows what will take place. His son is already crowned as king in his death and resurrection. His return will be just as clear as that cross on the hill. Look at verses 27 and 28. So don't be deceived. That's the close-up of the big picture. And when Jesus does come back, I'm at point six on the outline, it will be unmistakable. Uh, Just look there in verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Then all the peoples of the earth will mourn. They'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He'll send out his angels with a loud trumpet and they'll gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. It, It will be so clear you will not miss it. The world might mourn. But God's mob will cheer because the days are finished. It will be as obvious as vultures over an African play. You know where the corpses are. And at that moment, all the suffering and the oppression and damage committed to God's people will be finished and they will be gathered in one place. You will not miss it. You don't need a secret knowledge. You don't need to visit a website. You don't need to read a special book or understand special numbers. You don't need a special alphabet or a special set of spectacles. He'll be there. And the whole world will see the one who walked out of a tomb after he rode into his city on a donkey. At that point, Jesus has answered his disciples, hasn't he? He's painted a very clear picture of when. These things will happen with the temple. And now he turns to deal with the timing question in greater detail. Look there in verse 36. Now now concerning that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, except the Father only. Look there in verse 42. Therefore be alert, since you don't know what day your Lord is coming. You, You know those words, don't you? Do you know those words? Can I plead with you to apply them? You don't know the day, so don't worry about the day. You can't mark it in a calendar. 
You can't put, put it into your phone so it beeps. You just need to know that it will happen. And when it does happen, it'll be very clear. Do you notice Jesus tells you? It's just like the fig tree. <laughs> you know when to go to look for figs, don't you? It'll be very clear. Uh, we live in a moment that's very clear, don't we? Rumours of war, natural disaster, great suffering, great deception, great falling away, great news proclaimed. When's Jesus coming back? He's coming back. And he piles image upon image to drive home his point. Uh, remember the day of Noah? They were caught unprepared. Remember the day your house was burgled? You were caught unprepared. Remember the images there of people working in the paddocks? They were caught unprepared. So here is the command that goes with the timing. Look there in verse 44. This is why you also must be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And the readiness is faithful obedience. Who then is a faithful and sensible slave whom his master has put in charge of his household to give them food at the proper time? Readiness is faithful obedience. Clear commands, clearly obeyed. The disciples have been deceived. I'm at the last point on the outline. The disciples have been deceived by those whopping great big stones, haven't they? By how beautiful the stonework was, by how shiny the edifice is. And Jesus says very clearly, it's going to be destroyed. When's this going to happen? When are you going to come back? And Jesus' response is very clear. He doesn't give us a program, does he? But he paints us a picture, a portrait of what it means to be the people of God. The destruction of the temple will be unmistakable, and it did happen, and there was great suffering and great deception, great falling away, and great news was proclaimed. The end of the world will be the same, but on a much more grander scale. And so Jesus says very clearly, don't watch for the day, be ready for the day. Don't watch for the day, be ready for the day. Uh, let me read to you a quote from Mr. Brunner. The signs of the end are not so much decipherable political events as they are warnings to be level-headed, clear-thinking, warmly loving Christians in difficult times. Jesus does not so much charge the air with signs as he charges the disciples with sobriety. Jesus' sermon does not intend to create apocalyptic prophets, but to create spiritual long-distance runners. It does not so much give disciples supernatural knowledge as it supplies disciples with supernatural endurance. The sermon forms Christians. So what does such readiness look like? It looks like faithful obedience. Listen to Jesus and obey. It looks like being alert and prepared by knowing his word. It looks like being discerning people who are not deceived by false prophets, false teachers, false proclaimers. It looks like not being alarmed or distressed at these events. God the Father knows the day. It looks like people who persevere and don't sprint, not because it's comfortable, not because it's easy, but because Jesus is trustworthy. It looks like being a people who pray, utterly dependent. It looks like being a proclaiming people who are keen and eager to share the truth about Jesus with every outsider. So be reassured, we're in the last days. We don't need a rapture-ready website, or a rapture index, do we? Such things are part of the great deception. What we do need is God's word in Jesus, the fellowship of God's people, prayer, proclamation, and mutual encouragement. Let me pray.
Father, thanks for this sermon. Thank you that Jesus paints a portrait of his people rather than a program for his people. Uh, There is great distress, Father. Uh, That is right at the suffering of others, but not necessarily at the day. Uh, Father, please work in us kindness, love, gentleness, grace, trust, service, and above all, a faithful obedience to you so that we proclaim to the world that the days are grim but the news is good and that the king who came in on a donkey walked out of the tomb is seated at your right hand and will come back soon. Father, please encourage us to persevere until that day. Amen. Any quick questions? Mr Stiller. Oh, strike a light, you expect that. Gee whiz. Verse 34. I'm just opening my Bible up again. A preacher should never shut their Bible after a sermon, should they? Verse 34. Uh, then the king... Uh, no, sorry, verse 34. I uh, assure you this generation will certainly not pass until all these things take place. Yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> no, 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 you're right. I think, I think this is one of the... What was, what was the... Um, what was the second key? Remember I said there were three keys. First was language. Third was, he's talking to his mob. Second was now events give you a lens for the then events. So it is for these guys, the destruction of the temple will happen in their lifetime. This generation will see the end, which is the temple destroyed. But every generation will be looking towards the end and we might be the generation that reads that and goes, oh, the end of the world's just happened. So I think it's a now but then. So now, yes, you 12, you will see the end of the temple. You'll experience all of those great things that I just described. But every generation that reads it is this generation. And so it encourages us to be prepared because it might happen in our day. Does that make sense? Yeah. (laughs) Mr. Brunner, he's great. (laughs) Any other questions? Yeah, Nito. Yeah, it, it, yeah. so Anita's, Anita's asked a really good question. How can be being overly interested in the date take you away from Jesus? I, I think firstly it takes you away from Jesus because Jesus says very clearly you don't know the date. So to be overly interested in the date, is, I, I'm going to be really blunt here, is to be disobedient to Jesus because Jesus says you don't know it. And not even me in the flesh knows it, says Jesus. So I think that's actually... We're not game enough to say that because it is so offensive, but to be overly interested in working out what day it is, the time, the year, I think is to be disobedient to Jesus. I think secondly, it's a classic devil playbook. What's the devil love doing? Distraction. And the best way to distract people is to get them to to be distracted by good stuff because if they're distracted by the good stuff, they'll not pay attention to the best stuff. Okay, And it's good to get prepared for that day, but if you get so prepared for that day and your focus is on that day, you'll actually forget the commands of Jesus, which are don't worry about that day, worry about this. Persevere, be alert, proclaim, love your neighbour, those kind of things. So I think in those two ways uh, it, it, it actually is, is, a, is a problem. Yeah. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Pete. That's all right, mate. You're at the toilet. That's fine. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, why does all this bad stuff have to happen? I'm going to answer this really briefly. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5, and then we'll sing why Romans chapter 5 happens with yet not I. Okay. So Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, okay? Uh, what are we in verse 1? Just yell it out, someone. Right? We're declared righteous by faith. Who do we have peace with? God through whom? Jesus. What also do we have? Verse 2. 
access by faith into grace. We stand in that now and we rejoice in the hope of Jesus coming back. Until that day, what are we going to experience in verse 3, 4? We're going to experience a number of things. What are we going to experience? Afflictions. What will affliction produce? Endurance. What will that produce? Character. What will that produce? Hope. And then what will happen? Verse 5. God's love has been poured out in us and will not be disappointed. Can I tell you, no one wins the Olympic marathon without running 200 k's a week. Do you think that's easy? Do you think there's no pain? Do you think you aren't putting your body through strenuous effort? But if you do that, you have been trained to persevere. And I think that's exactly what's happening now. We are being trained to persevere. I think it's doing a number of other things. It's reminding us how broken the world is. No one says this is as good as it gets. I think it's also discipline of a father with his children as he shows that's what your sin leads to. But I think first and foremost, living as God's people in a broken world and experiencing that makes us rely on God and that will never disappoint us.